Our Old Testament reading this morning are words from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not slip, let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, the one who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. The Lord will watch over your life. And the Lord, our God, will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. Our New Testament reading comes from the letter to the Corinthians, the people of Corinth, in the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 3. And yet I will show you the most excellent way, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and cannot fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. This is God's holy word for us this day. On your yellow insert this morning, on one side, you will find a litany of celebration and invite you to participate in this responsive litany. Lord God, creator, for calling us to faith through your word and bringing us together in the body of Christ, for awakening in us to the urgency of your mission, for the privilege of taking your word into all the world, we give you humble thanks and praise. We give thanks for the faith of founders of this congregation 110 years ago. This day, O oh Lord, we remember the past. We remember the vision of mission and the desire to build a church of those who first came to buyers over 110 years ago. We remember their determination to show others how beautiful it is to believe in the triune God. We remember their willingness to say, here I am, send me. Give, Give us, we pray, that same vision and determination. This day, O oh Lord, we reflect on the task. We reflect on being entrusted with the message of reconciliation and bringing your word to all who are seeking. Cause our reflection to lead us to action. This day, O oh Lord, we look forward to rejoicing that will last, to the rejoicing, to the rejoicing others will experience through our mission in the community and the world, to the rejoicing of future generations who will call this church home. May, May that future joy be ours now and always with so many witnesses in a great cloud on every side of us. We call on your abiding attention, love, and guidance that we may be your faithful people through another day, another week, another year. Amen. Celebrating 110 years in mission and ministry, within the midst of our Lenten study, Come to the Mountains, seems very appropriate. While we might not be climbing any mountains in our liturgy and message this morning, 
as we have in the past couple weeks. We are remembering the pioneers, the faithful, who had the foresight, the stamina, and the servanthood to endure the hardships necessary to establish and preserve this congregation, this heritage, for over six generations as well as future generations beyond today. Byers Community Church has been a vital ministry and faith community for 110 years on our side of the mountain, as the Eastern Plains are sometimes referred to. While we can certainly get a great view of the Rocky Mountains on a clear day, Pikes Peak to Long's Peak, here on the plains, we know of the spiritual mountains that have been climbed for this congregation to be celebrating today and this year. Mountains of courage, fortitude, faithfulness, caring, love, and belief that God's love conquers all things, and sometimes that our faith is all that sustains us in the midst of hardship. The 110 years have not always been easy, but through it all the people have endured, as they will continue to do in the days, months, and years to come. On this third Sunday in Lent, we celebrate 110 years of memories. On Ash Wednesday, as we gathered, I shared the scripture story of the Israelites, God's chosen people of the Old Testament. Having wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, finally are standing on the edge of the Jordan River, ready to cross over with their new leader, Joshua. Joshua chapter 4 shares that story. Once the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord told jo Joshua, who then instructed the people, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean, tell them. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. The reason was to remind them and their children of God's faithfulness. Even when they were frustrated, hungry, and thirsty, wanted to turn back, and when they were tired and ready to give up. They are memory stones, Joshua called them, a memorial forever. When your children ask you, he said, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know the story, share the memories. As we held small stones that night, I challenged those of you gathered to let them be your memory stones for Lent. But today on this day of celebrating 110 years of mission and ministry, I wonder what 12 stones of memory might represent for this congregation. <clears throat> if a child were to ask any of us about the memory stones of Byers Community Church and ask, what do these stones mean? What story? Would we share? So let's share a bit about our story with a little help from some of our faithful church family. I invite Bart Mossbarger, whose family has been part of this congregation for six generations, to bring forward our first memory stone. The Presbyterian Church in Byers has had more than one beginning. Records share that as early as 1896, there was a Presbyterian movement in place as people gathered for Sunday school and in homes to worship. Organized by the Home Mission Committee with the Reverends Dr. Kirkwood and L.T. Burbank, Mr. O.L. Gilmore mentioned as an ordained elder and 43 members were accepted enrolled on 
began on June 14th, 1896, as part of this mission church. For reasons not known or stated in records, this church was dissolved two years later on April 14th, 1898. Invite our second stone to be brought forward. In 1903, there was at least a mission church to provide baptisms in this area, followed a year later in 1904 with the Byers Ascension Mission, built on land donated by Richard Price, homesteader on the East Bijou Creek. The first church in a 40-mile radius of Byers was built with the first service in October of 1907. However, just four months later, in February of 1908, the church was destroyed by a fire. Services were then held in the schoolhouse and then the town hall, with leadership traveling by train from Hugo, and it appears that in time that mission became St. Paul's Episcopal Church with a building built in 1932. Stone number three. Following the fire, a meeting was called on April 11, 1908, to organize the Byers Church Society. Membership required an interest in building a union church with no age limit, no profession of faith, no subscription to creed, no ecclesiastical requirements. The purpose of the Byers Church Society was to foster the moral and religious sentiment of the community and to establish a church home for the benefit of everyone who may desire to attend. Listed as dues-paying members at 10 cents a month, <laughs> the Byers Church Society included Mr. and Mrs. George Snow, Mrs. Monroe, Mrs. George Allen, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Burton, Mr. and Mrs. L.A. Hayes, Mr. and Mrs. A.N. Teller, Ava Snow, Anson Snow, Ruth Teller, Leona McDonald, a local school teacher who would become Mrs. Ernest Gerstenberger, Willard Teller, Mrs. Cora Payne, Mrs. John Clark, who with her husband built the second dwelling in Byers, and Mrs. Emma Jackson. Stone number four. The first Presbyterian Church of, By of Byers Church Society, the first president of the Byers Church Society was H.J. Hampman, Vice President Robert Burton, owner of the general store, a lumber yard, a livery stable, an ice house, and a brick yard. Secretary was Willard Teller and treasurer Anson Snow. Trustees were George Snow, Anson's father, homesteader, rancher, postmaster, and owner of the general store before Burton, and bank owner. Charles S. Owens, a local sheep rancher, and A. M. Teller. Since there was no church building at this time, the society met at Dick Hefner's saloon, where the American Legion Hall stands today. Mr. Hefner served as minister for some time, driving in from his homestead near the Hopewell School. These are the people who dreamed of and made this congregation a reality in the early 1900s. Stone number five. Two years later, on March 10th, 1910, Dr. Beavis of the Home Mission Committee organized a Presbyterian church in Byers. 18 members were received into the Byers church with L.A. Hayes, George C. Miller, and David W. Quinby elected elders. Also taking part in the services were elders George M. Ames, William M. Scott, 
and W.H. Shruman. The members of the Byers Church Society voted to transfer their property and their interests to the newly organized Presbyterian Church. Reverend Luther Elwood was the first minister, also serving the Peoria <coughs> Church, started at the same time, which was dissolved in 1912 with those members transferring to the Byers Church. While this church was being built, services were held each Sunday in a old hall in a grove of trees about a block west of here. Stone number six. Seven lots were donated to the church by the Marysville and Colorado Land Company. Two more lots were purchased with money from the Ladies' Aid Society. The masonry work was done by a Denver firm. Edward Payne, one of the first church trustees, was the designer, contractor, and did a lot of the early carpentry work. Mud bricks from Robert Burton's brickyard in the south part of town, a property owned by Ellis Hodges, were used to build inside walls. Bricks were made from the mud dug on site, molded and carted to a sunny spot where they were allowed to dry. Then they were stacked in a thick layer of mud plastered over the whole pile. A fire was then built underneath them, and the bricks baked for several days. Those mud bricks still are the foundation for this congregation in this church. Stone number seven. On July 23rd, 1911, the first Presbyterian Church in Byers, Colorado, was dedicated. The morning service opened at 11 a.m. with a sermon by Reverend Robert Stone, chairman of the Home Missions Committee of Denver Presbytery and a pastor of North Presbyterian Church in Denver, followed by the reading of the dedication service by Reverend Creighton K. Powell, the pastor evangelist of Denver Presbytery, and the closing prayer was by Reverend Luther Elva Lute, the first pastor, who came to Colorado for health reasons and pastored from October 1910 to April 1917. There was an intermission for lunch, which was served in that old hall in the grove next to it where the congregation had been worshiping until this new church was complete. Music was furnished for lunch by the Leisure Band, a local family. Following lunch, the Lord's Supper was observed and the baptism of infants, youth, and adults, including 11-year-old Sarah Payne, and the reception of new members. Stone number eight. At the time of the dedication service in 1911, the session included L.A. Hayes, A.L. Maxwell, editor of the local paper, as treasurer, George C. Miller, the clerk, and David W. Quinby. Trustees were L.A. Hayes as president, Mrs. A.L. Maxwell as secretary, Edward S. Payne, the contractor, Mrs. Frances Snow, who would become married to George Anson Snow, and Willard, Willard Teller. Church treasurer was Miss Ava Snow, also the teller at her father's bank, who would later marry William Nordlow. The building cost between $3,000 and $4,000. The Presbytery donated $1,000 to complete the building. The church was free of debt on dedication day, except for the equipment. This included 132 opera chairs at $170 each, a furnace, a second hand, Pump organ, song books, and acetylene gas lights. And that was a big deal since most people still used oil lamps in their homes. Stone number nine. So picture this sanctuary with the front doors of the church being where we enter the sanctuary today, and the early families gathering for worship, Bible study, and meetings. Walter Floreth 
served as organist. Also a farmer whose wife, Hannah, and their son, Russell Flora, who owned and ran the Byers Hardware Company from 1940 to 1974, were all charter members. Over the years, additions were made to the building, including the front entrance, addition to the sanctuary, the bell tower with the steeple and the cross added later. Stone number 10. Like many churches across Colorado in the 1930s, by the 35th anniversary, the church was in financial difficulties. At the end of 1933, the end of the year balance was $11.95. But they pushed on. In 1938, our Good Shepherd painting was completed by Dixie March, daughter of interim pastor Reverend Frank March, serving from 1937 to 1939. In 1949, it was voted on and action taken for the same pastor, Reverend Arnold John Bloomquist, to serve the churches of Byers, Wolf Creek, and Strasburg. In 1959, the church changed its name and became known as First United Presbyterian Church of Byers. And at the 50th anniversary, in 1960, membership was reported at 91, with Reverend Bloomquist serving both Byers and Strasburg churches as pastor. Stone number 11. In 1972, the name changed one last time to the current Byers Community Church. Still a church in the Reformed tradition of the Presbyterian Church after 110 years. Stained glass windows were dedicated, one purchased by the Mariners who were organized in 1957 with eight couples as the dry land swabbies, and other windows dedicated by Byers families. Woodwork by members completed, and many other donations of time, talents, and treasures fill the walls of this church. This little white red brick church has continued to prosper, to add additions to its building, renovations, and when the wind knocked the cross off, adding a dormer to the old church tower and replacing the cross as it stands today. We have continued to update and renovate our space with most recently new carpet and new front doors. Stone number 12. As we celebrate 110 years as a worshiping community of faith in Byers, Colorado, we remember the words shared at the dedication on July 23rd, 1911. Today we enter into a service which marks an epic in the brief history of this little congregation. This substantial and beautiful building represents the gift of both time and treasure. The sacrifice and devotion of the loyal hearts will prevail when coupled with a fixed purpose. Is God content with the offering of brick and plaster or wood and cement when richer gifts are rightfully the Lord's? Does God not look beyond the gift of the givers? Let us then give ourselves to God without stint or reserve, freely and truly. Several families that have been a part of our history, part of the memories marked by these stones. Families that still are a part of our faith community today. For example, the Gerstenberger and Dodge families, who have had six generations of family worshiping here. The Guy family, with three generations. The Tippett family, four generations. The Todd and Elderinghoff families, four generations. Family names in this community that have been a part of our legacy as Byers Community Church across the generations. Those that have left their legacy, even throughout this town. Barnes. Bloomquist, Burton, Clark, Dietrich, Flora, Norlow, Payne, Peterson, Pope, and Price, 
among others. Families and the generations that followed have continued to be a part of this faith community and part of the stones that are now the legacy for the future. While some of you today have connections with the generations who built this church, others have connections with the generations of more recent years who have continued to serve faithfully. And still others of us are part of the most recent history. Every one of us, no matter the length of history we have been a part of, are memory stones and part of the story that will be told to our children, their children, and on to their children, our great grandchildren, when they ask, what do these stones mean? We are challenged this Lenten season, even as we celebrate 110 years of ministry and mission, to be living stones, to tell the story of this faith community, of God's amazing love in this place and in the world, and to be the church of today and the future, carrying on the legacy that has been gifted to us. As we continue to move through the rest of Lent, may we also be aware of these memory stones that we have laid, our foundational story of God's faithfulness on this side of the mountain and on the eastern plains of Colorado. That our stones are living stones and that we are challenged not to wait for the stones to shout as they do in scripture, but for us to do the shouting. The good news is this, God's love endures forever, and the Lord is guiding the future of Byers Community Church, just as God and the Spirit have guided our past. Let us each be the living stones that shout to all that will listen that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, God's love endures forever, and the Holy Spirit is alive and moving for many more years in this faith community of Byers Community Church. May it always, always be so. Amen.